free to play. Ugh. Just saying those words kind of makes my gut go into a twist. I don't like it. Too many bad examples. Well, they can't all be bad, though. And there's a lot of decent free-to-play games out there, right? I mean, granted, when we hear free-to-play, we think about terrible things like APB Reloaded, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, games like Dungeon Keeper, Clash of Clans, even non-mobile games like War of the Roses, which I played for a little bit, but its pay-to-win aspects became very apparent. Best armor, best weapons, so much gold it takes money to acquire them. Ugh, no thanks, I've got better things to do. Like not play Warface. But rags, I can hear some of you say, Game X is not pay to win. Well, they keep popping up on pay to win lists, and I keep reading in forums about them, and there seems to be enough people who think that they are. Granted, I haven't played every one of these games, but come on, cut me some slack, Jack. Like I said, I have better things to do. Like play Dirty Bomb. Love me some Dirty Bomb. Yep, it's finally time to talk about Dirty Bomb. I've mentioned it many times in the past, in previous videos, on Twitter, a lot of people tell me that they've never heard of it, they've never tried it, they didn't want to foray into yet another first-person shooter that's free-to-play. Free-to-play shooters, they say. And I can't really blame them. They do have a negative reputation. They get a bad rap. People say, oh, it's free-to-play. Yeah, sure, that's great when you spray-paint it on the front of the game. I love getting hooked into free-to-play games and learn that free-to-play actually means pay-to-win. Or even the concept of pay-to-skip, which is, yeah, pr it's in Dirty Bomb, but look, pay-to-skip is on a spectrum. You know what else is on a spectrum? Not gender. Maha! But when the developer hits this pay model just right, free to play sings. Dirty Bomb is a prime example of what happens when a company makes a game that is both fun to play, that is deep, that is free to play, and at the same time doesn't feel like they're getting greedy or they're just trying to make a quick buck. Dirty Bomb is developed by Splash Damage. You might recognize them because recently they worked on Gears of War 4, the Gears of War Ultimate Edition as well. They did, of course, Dirty Bomb. They did Brink, Enemy Territory Quake Wars, the Doom 3 multiplayer, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory. They have a lot of experience in first-person shooters, and I think that it really shows here in Dirty Bomb. The game up until recently, just a couple months ago actually, was published by Nexon, and you could think of them what you will. But now full publishing rights belong to Splash Damage. They have full control over marketing, the servers, anti-cheat. And that was in early February when they announced this as something that was going to happen, finally getting control over their game. Which is good. I was worried that this game would get stale and it would die off. I didn't want that to happen. I really like Dirty Bomb. And since we've seen that, we've already seen them working on one of the biggest flaws of this game, which is the lack of maps. They've worked on the anti-cheat, the balance. They've worked on getting competitive up and running a bit better. And I do have high, high hopes for the future of this game, and I want to see it succeed. In a world full of free-to-play first-person shooters, one that is not legitimately pay-to-win is a very, very welcome sight. And hopefully, the success of this game could shine a light for others to follow. If someone told me that Dirty Bomb was the best free-to-play, objective-based shooter that was on the market, I don't think I'd disagree with them. It is as fun and fast-paced as it is fair and balanced. Not to say it's, it's perfect, it, no, no game is perfectly balanced, but we'll get into that later. It is a deep game, if not necessarily content-rich. It's a game like a Counter-Strike, a, a game that doesn't on the surface seem to have a lot in it, but is extremely, is extremely skill-dependent. Dirty Bomb is exactly that. It's a skill-dependent game. It's a game that keeps you coming back because it's so much about how good you are, how much you practice. Because the only way to do good in Dirty Bomb is to practice. There's no quick way out. There's no easy way in. When people ask me, Rags, how are you so good at Dirty Bomb? And look, even I have a long, long way to go. The skill ceiling is so high, you're always going to find people who just kick your ass. People ask me, how do I get better? And all I say is, well, you just practice. I really don't have anything else to say. Practice, practice, practice. Let's start going down my bullet points here. We gotta find out just why Dirty Bomb is a game I think everyone who enjoys team-based gameplay, objective-based gameplay, or first-person shooters should at least try out. It is, after all, free to play. You don't lose anything except some time for giving it a whirl. Is Dirty Bomb pay to win? No. Dirty Bomb is not a pay to win game. If you go into Dirty Bomb with money to spend, can you get things faster? Absolutely you can. 
Will this give you a competitive advantage against other players? Well, it would be so minor it basically would not exist. I'm going to go with the reality here and not the technicality. Let me explain what I mean. Think of Dirty Bomb as a Battlefield meets Overwatch, a combination of the two, an objective-based hero shooter with a loose class system. In the barracks menu, you can choose between all of the mercs that you have currently unlocked and the ones that are on the free rotation. You can put them into your current squad, which is composed of three different characters. In the main menu, and before a game begins, you have the option to change the loadout that your squad has, as well as the members of the squad itself. When a game begins, you've got what you've got. It's good to keep a nice variety of different characters that you like or that would be useful for the team in here. At this moment, I have a pretty good uh, variety going for me. Stoker in the top left gives ammo and can throw Molotovs that can give area denial and prevent enemies from getting to objectives or through choke points. Aura in the top right is one of the starting medics, and I think she's the best. She puts down a health turret. Anybody standing inside of the health turret's range regenerates health. Proxy at the bottom is an engineer, so she repairs and disarms things much quicker than regular characters, and her ability is that she can put down mines. They explode when an enemy gets close. There are other assault-style mercs, medics, engineers, and we'll get into those later. Each merc has a variety of different loadout cards. This determines their primary, their secondary, their melee weapons, as well as small abilities that they have. For the most part, these abilities are not exactly, well, game-changing at all. You can do fine even with default mercs who don't have any abilities at all, though the time you'll actually spend using the lowest tier cards that there are, well, you blink and you'll miss it. Loadout cards go from the default to lead to iron, to bronze, silver, gold, cobalt, and then they have the specials that are promotional or that you get from playing competitive. But even these are basically just reskins of other cards. Anything above bronze rarity is only aesthetic. You do not get any actual objective advantage from using the rarer cards. They're just bling, basically. Every single card in the game, with the exception of the promotional cards, which don't give you extra power anyway, are obtainable through playing the game, not spending any money. Golds and Cobalts obviously will cost a whole lot more because they are much more rare. As you can see, I only have two, and I've played this game over 500 hours. And of those two, I only use one. The Aura is not, I mean, it's alright, I guess. When someone kills you in Dirty Bomb, it's because they were better than you in that moment, or they had better positioning, or they got you when you were weak. It's not because they just had an OP card. Here are some silvers, for instance. This loadout system is one of the reasons that Dirty Bomb is such a great game to play, because yes, there is an element of randomness to it, and you pretty much do acquire all of your cards at random, though you can control that randomness to some degree. As I said before, the most powerful cards in the game are the bronze ones and it takes only 1,500 credits in-game, which takes basically no time at all, in order to get them. People don't run around in this game with cobalt and gold cards as the reason why they beat you. Eventually, you will acquire cards that you don't particularly care for. What you can do is you can recycle old ones to get a balance of recycling points that you can use to get new cards. Also, I think I call them cards, and they're not technically cards, they're loadouts, but whatever, bear with me here. Using in-game items, you can also craft your own cards if you want a more specific loadout for a character. So if I want a new Phoenix loadout, I can choose to craft one of a certain rarity, and then it'll tell me how much it costs in fragments and credits, and it'll show you the possibilities of what you can get as a result. You can choose from the lowly iron cards, the bronze cards, and again, once you get to bronze, you're getting the most powerful loadouts available. Anything past here is aesthetic like the silver cards and the gold cards, as well as the ultra-rare cobalt cards. There are more cards to get potentially from silver, gold, and cobalt loadouts because they offer different camouflages. But really the most important thing is what the primary weapon is and how you feel about it, what the secondary is, what the melee is, and what the abilities for the card are, some abilities being better than others depending on the characters. And again, the abilities are pretty minor, but I'll get to those in a second when we get back to characters. There's, there's a lot to cover for this game. I'm going to skip around just a wee bit. Yes, of course, there is a store option. They have to make money somehow, but they do it in a very fine way. 
You can buy bundles, which have mercs and packs of cases that give you loadout equipments. You could choose between specific ones you want. You could buy mercs if you don't want to purchase them using in-game credits. Some bundles have multiple mercs in them, which is a good way to spend money if you like the game and don't want to go through the grind. You can buy items that help you to craft cards or craft specific cards that you want if you don't feel like you've prayed to the RNG gods enough. And you can buy boosters that help you earn more credits in-game. Though you can also acquire these from regular gameplay itself. You can put trinkets on your guns, as you'll see the Doge trinket on pretty much all of the gameplay you'll see in this review and in stuff in the future and past. And you can also buy cases that give you ranked skins from playing ranked using ranked points. But cases here will probably be what you will buy the most. A case contains a random loadout. You'll probably buy mostly just standard equipment cases for just a thousand credits each. Another thing I like about this game is how they show you the exact chances of what the potential loadout card rarity could be. So, you have a pretty good chance of getting a lead or iron card, and you have a 1 in 1,000 chance of getting a cobalt. And you scoff at that, but I've gotten them twice. The only cobalts that I've ever got are from these cases. Just luck of the draw. <clears throat> We're gonna get sweaty tonight, folks. Things you'll know if you're a woman on the internet. Um, where the ladies' room is on the internet? Oh, no, I got a cobalt. Feeding on the no. Four hundred and forty something hours, and I got my second cobalt on the internet. <laughs> oh <laughs> my god! Yeah, Holy sure shit! And it actually looks like it's a <laughs> Women pretty are good one. Oh, say that, and it's not officially. Oh, <laughs> oh, cobalt Hello. randomly yeah. pulled. All right. All right. Also, you should go and subscribe to Doctor Randomer Cam. If you want to spend real money, you can. Then you can buy expert cases with better potential loadout card rarities. If you want to spend even more, you can get these uh, elite cases, and they'll give you even better cards, or at least more rare ones. You can pour as much money as you want into Dirty Bomb, but it will not make you a better player. It won't give you better cards than someone who doesn't spend a dime. You might get them quicker, yeah, maybe. But the better player is always going to be the winner. The team that communicates and works the best with one another is going to win the day. Spending $100 in Dirty Bomb will get you just more rare cards, not better ones. I can't stress it enough. My personal advice is that if you play this game, well, just try it out. See if you like it. See if you think this is a game that you could sink a lot of hours into. If you want, and if you do enjoy it, and since you haven't actually spent any money, the bundles are actually of a pretty darn good value and they give you a lot. So maybe it would be best for you to buy a starter pack or something along those lines to kind of help you along, give you the variety that you might want. If you don't want to spend money, then it won't be too bad. I mean, yes, they do have to make a buck, but they do it in a fair way. You gain credits for how well you do and how much experience you get in the game and by completing challenges like getting a certain amount of score with this merc in your squad or getting a certain amount of objective experience or combat experience or game mode experience or uh, support experience. Getting a certain amount of experience in a certain game mode, that sort of thing. That'll get you credits too. You also get them from winning your first game of the day and finishing your first game of the day. Those two right there are enough to buy an equipment case for instance. Also, at random, at the end of every game, I don't know exactly what the rates are. It's probably around one in three or so games that you finish, you will get a free equipment case just for finishing the game. And don't quote me on the one in three thing. I haven't measured it, but it's fairly often. <laughs> you think I'm a good YouTuber? The characters that you play as in Dirty Bomb aren't quite as crazy diverse as they are in Overwatch. However, they do come in a wide variety of different sizes, speeds, and different roles that they play. Generally, they are divided into Assault, Medic, and Engineer, with variances in between these. Some mercs like Skyhammer getting revived there can give ammo to his teammates, and he can throw down an airstrike marker which coats a large area in explosions, which is good for uh, covering areas and taking enemies off of it or clearing objectives. You have characters like Aura here, the one who can put down a health station and revive teammates because, well, you know, that's what medics do. There are some sniper classes who can put down motion sensors. There are uh, characters who can put down smoke bombs and see through them with IR goggles. Some have huge miniguns. Artie can call an artillery strike. 
Phoenix can self-revive and send out a healing pulse around him. Sparks can revive friends and damage enemies at a distance with her laser gun. Fragger throws grenades. Fletcher can put out sticky bombs, which are manually detonated. The abilities of characters is very wide and can cover a wide range of topics and fulfill a wide variety of roles. Some characters are slower than others. Some characters are faster than others. Normally, as a general rule, the faster you are, the less health that you have. Aura, that you've been watching here in this gameplay, only has about 90 health, but she's very quick. She's lithe. She's springy. Big classes, like Rhino, who has a minigun, have 200 health, but are large and easy to hit and move slowly. Thunder's another large character. He has more health than most. He throws out concussive grenades, which are basically flashbangs. Amy's a sniper who throws out a little snitch device that can stop enemies from regenerating health. She's very small, too, and as a result of her quickness is, um, well, not very durable. And despite the massive variety between the characters and how they play and what their roles are and the weapons they can have equipped, and some characters can have the same weapon equipped as others, though there is a general rule that certain types of characters have certain types of weapons, for instance, the heaviest, most damaging, longer-range weapons will not be found on the medics. But the characters are all completely 100% doable. I have seen people do well with every single character, from Amy to Sparks to Stoker to Rhino. It doesn't matter who you pick, there is the potential for you to do well. Now, in more competitive play, you do see some characters pop up more than others. Stoker, Artie, Aura, Fletcher, uh, Fragger. But even then, you can do well with every character. So even at early points of the game, when you don't have a lot of characters unlocked, you can still do well and you can still contribute to the team. Obviously, some have an easier way of doing this than others. Some characters are more difficult to play and play well, but I think that's one of the reasons I keep coming back. It's kind of easy to play as Ara, for instance. A lot of her usefulness is passive. Set down a health station at a good spot, your teammates will gravitate towards it because health regeneration without healing is kind of slow. It's very important. Some characters, like Vasily the Sniper, or Sparks, the laser gun-toting distance reviver, can be a little bit more difficult to help the team with because they require an amount of precision that some characters... But I think that helps to make this game all the more rewarding. Because there is a variety of different characters, and because at the end of the day, how good you are with your abilities and how good you are at aiming your gun consistently at enemy players to take them out, that's what it all comes down to at the end of the day. There's no cheap way to kill people. There's no, there's no freebie class. There's no easy loadout. It's not like you can always fall back to a certain something that you know you can do good in unless you've actually practiced it. There's no easy mode. Every character requires a certain level of understanding. Every single weapon behaves differently, yet they're all viable. Every single one. And as I've said, in my time in Dirty Bomb, which is over 500 hours worth, I have seen excellent players playing every class and doing well. Experience isn't gained in some sort of a measurable metric. You don't level up your characters. You don't level up or rank up your weapons. You get better in this game by playing a lot. You learn how to do good at Dirty Bomb, which is something that a lot of games now can't say. You learn how to play this game. A part of it is definitely through trial and error. It's not an easy game to play, and it's, uh, it's underlying reliance on player skill on an individual level and how you can function with your team in terms of strategy and just cohesion. Those are the things that keep you coming back, but at the same time, it can be tough for new players. New players get stomped on in this game. I believe in this game that you're watching now, there was mostly newer, less experienced players in the lobby. I think at the end I was 54 and 4, which in Dirty Bomb is almost unheard of. I mean, I did amazingly well in this game because the skill gap is huge. There's not some easy loadout someone can just pick up and do well in. The game requires you to understand it, to learn the mechanics, and to practice, practice, practice. And the skill ceiling is tall as the sky. There's always somebody who is better than you. Because this is Dirty Bomb. You think you're good, you will eventually find somebody who will wring you out to dry like yesterday's laundry. 
That's part of the good and yet at the same time the frustrating aspect about this game. People with any character can kick your ass. They will thrash you, but you're just going to have to soak it up and get used to the idea that practice, practice, practice makes perfect. The character variety is enough in the terms of their roles and the weapons that they use to keep things constantly interesting, because again, at the core foundation, much like Overwatch and Counter-Strike Go, it all really comes down to learning the game and getting better and better, not necessarily trying to get that next unlock for your classes. The enjoyment you get from games like these, it's very, very raw in a way. Remember back in the day when fun was had by actually doing well and completing challenges and showing other players how skilled you were instead of, oh look, what can I unlock next? This game reminds me of those kinds of games. I play to do well, I play to get better, I play to improve myself. I don't play for the next skin, the next loadout, the next unlock. However, unlike Overwatch, um, which is a game I, I compare and contrast this to sometimes when I speak to people because a lot of people obviously know what Overwatch is. There was a negative aspect of the immense variety that came as part of the... Uh, down, that, there was a huge variety of characters in Overwatch. And the skill that you had with one character did not translate almost at all to any other character. If you're really good at Genji and you only play Genji, you can't just swap to Widowmaker and be great. You can't just swap to Soldier 76 and be great. You can't just swap to Winston and be great. Each character required care, attention, and learning and know-how in order to use very effectively. In a more forgiving way is Dirty Bomb, where at least in terms of the gunplay and how you move around and how the objectives are focused and how you actually go about with the combat and the shooting of the other team, the skills that you have with one character does translate much, much more easily into others. So, you have me using a M16 here as Stoker. Stoker's my boy. If I picked up Skyhammer, who also uses an M16 as one of his loadouts, I would be able to be effective with him. It's really just a matter of, am I going to be well at placing the airstrike? Not wasting it because it has, because of its power, a large cooldown. The game is very tough to learn, but it's much more forgiving in terms of being flexible with the characters that you have. I feel that, contrasted to Overwatch, the game is less reliant on you picking a character and learning the ins and out and everything about that single character, maining that character, having it be your number one character, and instead being able to be versatile and having a loadout of a couple characters that you can swap to and from as the team needs. In terms of team construction, there can be, I mean, as many of a single character as possible. So there can be multiple Skyhammers, multiple Auras, multiple Phoenixes, multiple Naders, but every player can only choose from the three that they have in their squad. So it has a way of balancing itself out. That's why it's good to have a variety. So you can have an engineer you could swap to if you need to respawn and get to the objective quick to disarm it, or if you're on the defensive side, maybe you need to swap to a, a medic with a health station or a proxy with mines to put down his traps. It's important, though, in terms of a shooter, that the shooting elements of the game are what is nailed. It's one of the reasons why I can see the appeal in Counter-Strike Go, but I don't really like the game much at all. I don't like the actual gunplay. I don't like the shooting mechanics. In Dirty Bomb, the way that guns behave and the health of characters and the damage of the weapons that you use is an excellent balance of low and high time to kill. It's reminiscent of Halo in a way, where it can take 10 bullets to kill somebody, or it can take one, depending on the class and depending on what you do. Abilities that allow you to quickly kill enemies are very valuable, and often have long recharge times or just flat out require aiming skill. And that's basically what it always comes down to. Your skill at aiming the gun in your hands. How good are you with the gun that's in your hands? Like the old Call of Duties, like uh, the older Battlefields. How good are you at putting that reticle on the enemies, keeping it there, and doing what you need to do? The importance of headshots and proper ranges and just sheer raw aiming ability, those are king and dirty bomb. It's something that you can always get better at, it's something that you can always improve upon, and it will ultimately win you the day. There are assault rifles, submachine guns, there are shotguns, pistols, longer range sniper rifles. They all kind of have their role, but even most maps, every single weapon has a place. 
and every single weapon allows you to do well, just like with every character. Almost all of your kills will be done with a primary weapon that you have. All the weapons are hitscan. Some of the abilities are like launching grenades, throwing frags, that sort of thing. They actually fly through the air. But it's fairly simple in that regard. There's no best gun. There's no cheap weapon. A lot of the times, the most potent weapons do require a high amount of skill in order to use. So, uh, burst fire weapons in this game, uh, they can get very inaccurate very quickly, especially if you spam them. They take patience and trigger discipline, but they have potentially really good damage output. There's no easy mode in this game. Even the grenade launcher here takes a while to recharge, has limited actual damage explosion range, and it does have limited, limited effectiveness. There's no freebie for a class that just lets you pick it up and start mopping the floor with enemies. The gunplay is solid, it's tight, it's very responsive. This game at high refresh rates plays fantastically. It has a fluidity to it that is almost unmatched. Not Battlefield, not Call of Duty, none of these games allow you to control a character with the amount of precision and with the amount of feedback that Dirty Bomb does. You move faster, like in Counter-Strike, with lighter weapons. So, you move slowest with your primary, you move moderately quickly with your secondary pulled out, and with your melee weapon, you will move the fastest. That's why you're constantly seeing me swap to my knife as I sprint away. And since I'm using a really good mouse, well, you know what, let's go ahead and plug this mouse. Bam, here it is. People ask me fairly often what mouse do I use. Here it is, the Logitech G600 MMO Gaming Mouse. It, it, don't buy the white one. Never buy a white mouse. Why would you ever do that? That's a terrible idea. Remember back when you used to play on the consoles like a peasant and you had that white controller and you noticed how all the gunk would build up on the buttons and in the ridges and in all the little, the little perforations in the plastic? Don't buy a white mouse. That would be dumb. I've used this mouse for years, probably about four years now. When it breaks, I'm going to buy another one. You kind of have to give it a claw grip, it's not a very big mouse, but it is insanely useful. It has a third mouse button at the top of it, which is, dear god, I can't go to a ba I can't go back to a double click mouse now, I can't do it. Only two buttons up top, for two fingers, what proletariat trash. And your thumb works all those buttons on the side, that's how I can switch between weapons so quick in games. One is my primary, two is my secondary, three, four, five, six, I get bam, 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 I can swap between whatever I want. That's why you can watch me in Dirty Bomb, how I'm pulling shit out with such precision, such grace, such finesse. This is the best mouse ever. It's amazing. And it also has really good software that lets you customize whatever you need it to do. I don't know if I have a rags approval system yet, but if I did, I would stamp this baby with my cock. Buy one. And get good. Now back to Dirty Bomb. You'll swap weapons as you need to move quick, or depending on what you need. Do you need to reload? You know, standard first-person shooter stuff. You'll get really good at it. When you get really adept in this game at swapping between the equipment that you've got, it has a really, I mean, like I said before, it's very fluid. You feel like you're in control of everything your character does. And as you've seen, like, like right there, you jump off walls and dirty bomb. You can have long jumps, which I highly suggest you bind to the left alt button like I do. You read the guide online. But you can jump. You can double jump. You can run around, you can be lithe and limber. Especially when you play light, quick classes like Aura and Proxy, bouncing around on the walls and jumping and just trying to evade fire can keep you alive for a surprisingly long time. Those little fuckers are hard to hit. Whenever you get taken down in this game, when your health gets to zero, you will enter this incapacitated downed state. When you're in that state, you can't return fire, but you're not dead yet. You can be revived by anybody on your team. Medics do it faster, and you are revived with more health, depending on how much they charged up their paddles or their revive rifle. So even when there are no medics around, you can pick up teammates that have gone down. It's also important, especially if the enemy team has active medics who are doing their job, God forbid, in a team-based game, it's important that you take out the enemies and finish them when they're on the ground so they can't be revived. The character Phoenix can revive himself if you don't take him out quick enough, and Nader can perform a martyrdom and explode when she goes down. It puts a new spin on prioritizing taking out enemy medics. But even within the medics in this game, there's variety in their roles. Uh, so you've got multiple medics, but you have Aura here, who's tiny, 
Doesn't have a lot of health, but she's quick. She has the health station. You've got Sawbones, who's larger. He has more health, moves a little bit slower, but he has more potent weapons, generally, but he doesn't heal quite as well. Sparks has the revive rifle, which has the potential to do high damage, but you have to be very precise and accurate with it to have it be worth its time, because our main weapons are weak-ass SMGs, even in the classes. There are these characters who kind of fit all sorts of different molds. Finding a favorite character, learning to do well with multiple characters, using their abilities best, and playing as the class is kind of designed to be played will help you win the game. Ultimately, it comes down to teamwork and knowing what you're supposed to be doing and doing what you're supposed to be doing as well as you can done did it. I have been heaping on the praise for Dirty Bomb. I love this game. You don't play a game for 500 plus hours if you don't like it. Granted, it hasn't always been sunshine, rainbows, lollipops, and pinatas full of vaginas. Dirty Bomb does have flaws. It has very real flaws. It has flaws that cannot be overlooked. It's not a perfect game, but it's a damn good one. Especially for the low, low price of zero dollars American. The community is kind of hit and miss. Some people can take this game very seriously. Too seriously. And I'll all be the first to admit... I sometimes am one of those people. This game pisses me off sometimes. But it pisses me off in a different way than games like Battlefield 1 do. Some faggots running around doing nothing but abusing the Model 10 Hunter, spraying people down with automaticos. True skill, I know. At least you can throw up your hands and say, well, he's using easy mode weapons and there's only so much I could do against that. In Dirty Bomb, though... There is so much balance, in, at least between the weapons and the classes, and it all really does come down to raw skill. When someone's mopping the floor with your face hole, there's not much you can do but just get frustrated because you know that they're actually better than you. And I hate it when people are better than me. It sucks. I want to be the very best. That no one ever was. To catch them is my real quest. To train them is Anyway, especially when you go into the competitive modes and you see people who are really good. Oh, you think you're good at Dirty Bomb? Then you get on competitive and there are teams who do nothing but play Dirty Bomb and they're coordinated and they never miss their shots. And ugh, I don't play much competitive, honestly. I just play public games. They can be challenging too. They, they absolutely are. I'm good, but damn. Sometimes you don't want to struggle for every inch of ground. But the competitive scene in this game, at least the infrastructure of it, is getting a lot better than it used to be. It's on the second season, it works fairly well, matchmaking is okay, it's alright, it's not perfect, it could use some improvements, uh, but the matchmaking used to be far, far worse than it is now. Pro tip, when it starts to widen its search parameters for people around your skill level, just start searching again. Or else it'll pair you up with people who know 10,000 times more than you do about this game and who worship this as a god and you will get your butt fucked and it will not be fun. You would think that I would enjoy that. I do not. This is not the kind of butt fucking that I enjoy. This is the bad kind. But getting a team together, even if it's just in public non-competitive games and coordinating, getting the right squad set up, Going through, playing well, there's a lot of fun to be had. It's also a good game to make new friends, to find people that are good, to find people who like to play as a team, who play the objective, and stick with them. I've made a lot of good friends from Dirty Bomb. The game's anti-cheat has been really good lately. They've rolled out a new kind because they got publishing rights, and the new anti-cheat system works fairly well. I've met a couple hackers but it definitely wasn't enough for me to warrant a warning by playing this game. It's not like how Daisy used to be. We got some OG Daisy players out there who remember how bad Daisy used to. Holy shit, Daisy used to be bad. <laughs> but Dirty Bomb's pretty good. I wouldn't worry too much about anybody circumventing the rules. For the most part, you shouldn't have an issue. Normally, when you get stomped on, it's because players are legitimately better than you. As frustrating as that might be, and as salty as fuck as I can get in Dirty Bomb, sometimes, because I, that's this is one of my games that I want to be super, feel like I have to be super pro in. Yeah, it's just best to count to ten, wind down, and realize that you're a scrub who needs to get good. Another thing that I really, really like about this game is that KD is only tracked per game. Yeah, in your stats, it'll show you how many kills and everything you've done. Yeah, yeah. But in the actual game, it shows the KD at the end. The scoreboard is determined by who has the highest score. 
not necessarily who has the highest amount of kills. Now, the scoreboard can really go to anybody. A really good medic can be at the top, even with a negative KD. If they revive people, if they give health all the time, then they can get a lot of points from doing that. You could be good, and you can be at the top of the scoreboard for doing nothing but getting combat points. You notice in this gameplay, you've had the experience pop up. Blue is support, yellow is game mode XP or objective XP, and blue is support. I already said that. This take is not going to be in the final cut. I lied, suck my dick. Red is combat XP. So if you kill enemies, you damage enemies, you get red combat XP. If you heal people, if you pick them up, if you give them support, you get support XP. If you are repairing objectives, arming objectives, blowing up objectives, you get yellow points. Winning games, that sort of thing. Every character has the potential to be at the top of the scoreboard realistically. Now, it's harder for some characters, like snipers, who do nothing but, you know, kind of hang in the back a little bit and give fire support with their longer range weaponry. But, even a good sniper can be at the top of the scoreboard. Like me. It's easy for Aura to be on top of the scoreboard if you put down, like, a health station at a good spot like this and your teammates mooch off of you. Like a porn star mooches off of a 96-year-old billionaire with a massive mansion and terminal prostate cancer. You know, I almost had that perfect on the first take, but I'm gonna run with it. There's a little pause. I was trying to think of an organ that could have cancer you could die from. Prostate was the winner of that little lottery in my head. Prostate. Congratulations, prostate cancer. You the real MVP. I wonder if prostate cancer is a feminist issue. Hmm. The most glaring negative about this game, though, is its lack of maps. This has been a problem for a while. There are not very many maps in Dirty Bomb. There are, like, five. They're not a lot. This footage, you've probably, you've seen this footage before. You probably know these maps by heart just from the random footage of gameplay that I've had in previous videos of mine. The maps are not huge. They're all well. They're, they're all good. I think that even the worst map in Dirty Bomb, <coughs> dome, even that is a pretty good map. I've never left a game because it was a map I didn't like. They're all fairly well constructed. Every character in every map has a viable path to take and has a role to play. Already they've announced the new map that they're working on that should be out fairly soon now that they've got the publishing rights to themselves. And I foresee maps coming out a lot quicker, as they have said, because they're not tied to Nexon like they used to be. But there aren't a lot of maps. You're going to know every single nook and cranny and corner and dustbin and waste paper basket on every single map. You get the same thing happening as you ha as happens in Counter-Strike Go and in Overwatch. Again, I'm pulling these two examples out. We all know them. Every single spot on this map you will eventually recognize. You'll know the paths, you'll know the places to stand. It's not as it's not as devastating as it is in those games, especially in Counter-Strike when one bullet will kill you. But, knowing the maps is just something you'll do, because you don't have a choice, because there's not many maps. This game needs more maps, okay? It has a severe lack of maps. Much like I have a severe lack of sleep tonight. The server browser is fairly decent, however, jumping into games randomly can put you in some pretty sticky situations. Being good in this game often leads you carrying your team. Some of you just suck at video games and you don't have to worry about that. I know, the struggle is real, but for some of us good people, Dirty Bomb is one of those games that really tests your ability to carry a team. It's tough to be good at this game. Lord knows there have been times when I've been stinking it up and someone better than me has brought us to victory. Some games will be over in an instant because your team sucks and the other team's better. And they're not even necessarily communicating or doing all that well. They're just better than you in every way. Sometimes your team is just, just worse than... What's the worst thing in the universe? Starship Troopers 3. Sometimes your team is Starship Troopers 3, and sometimes the other team is the Revenant, and there's nothing you can do about it. You just gotta roll with the punches and get to what's real. That's two song references in this review. I want you to appreciate that. Van Halen? Jump? 1984? No? Alright. As far as player population goes, there's enough players to always find games during the day, though sometimes in the wee hours of the morning, it can be pretty tough to find games at least in your region. There's always people playing Dirty Bomb. There's enough to keep it populated. Whether or not there are regions around you, that's another thing. Ping is very important in this game. It's a game about precision. It's a game about fluidity. It's a game about headshots, keeping your aim up. And when the enemy team has high ping and it feels like you're fighting a bunch of time travelers, well, that can be really frustrating. That can be really frustrating. 
let's just say you're not going to get a huge selection of servers and games and player counts that you might want at really late hours in the day. Now, in terms of the players per game, it's a fairly small count game. The largest games are 16 players, which feels a little crowded to me. I think that, honestly, 6v6 is the best, though you learn to kind of deal with whatever. I would really wish if, instead of having the option to have 6v6, 7v7, and 8v8, it had the option to do 5v5, 6v6, and 7v7. I just think that eight people per side on these maps, a lot of the times these maps have very small choke points, and the maps can get a little just crowded in general. I think eight on each side is a little much. That's really just a taste issue, though. You might feel completely different, and that's fine. As for the modes in Dirty Bomb, there are three. Two of them really are just the same one twice over. The main mode is objective. There's a thing you have to do, your team has to do it, the other team is trying to stop you from doing that thing, and pretty standard fare. Some of them are as simple as arm a bomb, defend it until it goes off, or arm two bombs and defend it until they go off, or uh, defend the payload. Repair the objective and it moves forward as you're around it, you know, stuff you've seen a gajillion and 17 times before. There's also a third mode, or a second mode, depending on how charitable you're going to be to Dirty Bomb. It's execution. There are two pylons. Your team has a bomb. You have to arm the bomb at the pylons, blow the pylon up, but there are no respawns. It's basically search and destroy from Call of Duty. There's 12, 13, 14 rounds or whatever, and whoever wins the most wins the game, though they can end in a draw, which happens sometimes, and I don't even mind a game ending in a draw. I mean, sometimes these execution games are, are really tough. They're down to the wire. They're close. They can be very tense. But for the most part, I think the most popular mode by far is objective. The third, or second plus mode, is stopwatch. Stopwatch is objective twice. So you were attackers this round, you'll be defenders next round. Whichever team has the best score at the end will win. Whoever completes the objectives in the most time. Sorry, the least amount of time. Golf rules. Pardon me. Unfortunately, the problem with stopwatch is that it can take quite a while. Competitive games are stopwatch, not objective mode. They take a while, I wish they were shorter. Another issue is that teams can change in the middle of stopwatch games. So the team you start out with might not necessarily be the team that you end with. I mean, the, these games can take 20 minutes to do. Players join, players leave, yada yada yada. Luckily, you get to keep a lot of the uh, performance that you do if you do get disconnected from a game or if you leave a game. So I think things like credits and XP and stuff of that nature is tracked as you go and saved. It's not all or nothing at the end of a game. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I know it's not an all or nothing. This game doesn't have a host like, uh, say, Vermintide does, where if the host decides he's going to piss off 10 feet from the finishing line, it means that you've wasted your time, you get nothing, try again. Now, in these games, people can call votes. Votes to kick, yada yada. But, people can call votes to restart the map as long as the match hasn't been running for three minutes. Normally, this is fairly good to do. Sometimes, uh, if you, God forbid, the stars line up and people are coordinated and they actually want a close game, they can vote to shuffle the teams and then they could vote to restart the game so it can begin again as even as possible. Normally, though, this doesn't happen. Vote to restart map is extremely rare when it actually passes, and vote to shuffle the teams normally doesn't occur either. However, votes to shuffle the teams can occur very late in the game, which means that if, if things don't go your way or if there's a piece of shit in the lobby, they can call to scramble the teams really when it's too late for another team to come back from an impending dooming loss, but now you've been swapped to the losing team, so just suck it up. At least you get all your goodies for playing. The main problem with the vote to shuffle teams issue in Dirty Bomb is that it can be called multiple times. So, if it doesn't pass this time, well, they will, they'll, they'll try to shuffle again, and then they'll try to shuffle again, and then they'll try to shuffle again. If you're the kind of person who does this, you're a bad person, and you should feel bad. That's not something that would make your mother proud. That's some bullshit, okay? That, that's legit, that is some, though that is some legit bullshit in this game, the amount of times you can call to shuffle teams, and how late you can shuffle the teams. While it is incredibly frustrating when it actually happens, it is fairly rare when it really succeeds and is an issue. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Another flaw that this game possesses, and it's 
I don't know why this is in the game, to be honest. This is maybe one of the most unforgivable things that's wrong with this game, and it can be really, really frustrating. But for a game that's based on teamwork and competitive class-based coordination, playing with your friends is actually quite difficult. There is no in-game party system outside of competitive. So if you want to play you know, the normal game against normies, which is what I do almost exclusively, that means that you're going to have to kind of both get into the same game, and then as players leave and join, you have to team swap until you're all on the same team. And then the next game will start, and you'll have to do it all over again. So, getting four players on the same team, good luck. Getting two is a pain in the ass as it is. Three, doable, but frustrating. Until extremely recently, within the last couple days in fact, it was not even possible for you to get into competitive games with a certain amount of people in your squad. You either had to have one or two people, or you had to have a full group of five. Then they had to add the ability to do threesomes. Why this wasn't available from the start, I don't know. But there you go. However, this feature still isn't in regular, non-competitive play. And that's shocking for a game that's so teamwork-oriented. I don't, know what, I don't know whether this is a positive or a negative, though I'm leading toward it being a positive for the game, but there are a lot of games out there where winning gives you a lot of bonuses. If you win, you get a lot of extra stuff. In Dirty Bomb, this doesn't necessarily seem to be the case. You can still basically progress without any hindrance, even if you lose all the time. It is a team-based game. You get way more credit based on your individual performance in the game as opposed to whether or not your team wins the game. So if you go around healing people, uh, repairing objectives, defusing a C4, uh, picking up teammates, that will contribute to your own score. And whether you win or lose, you still get all that score anyway. Obtaining credits and XP is definitely in Dirty Bomb more of a journey over destination sort of thing. There's also a lack of customization for pretty much everything. You get what you get based on the loadout cards that you're using. There's no customization of weapons. You don't choose sights, you don't choose magazine sizes, you don't choose attachments, grips, barrels, anything like that. That's not what Dirty Bomb's about. It's about being good with the weapons that you're given. You're, it's about being good at the weapon that's in your hands and doing as best as you can with it. And every single weapon is viable, I can guarantee you that. You will naturally, though, develop favorites based on how they perform and based on how you perform. But everything from camo customization to actual weapon attachment changing, it doesn't exist in Dirty Bomb. That's not something you'll find here if that's what you're looking for. But don't worry, as a lot of people have asked me, a lot of people's primary concern in this game is, well, is the balance good enough to warrant that? Are all the weapons viable? Are all the characters viable? And they are. So don't worry. Also, the game has singing doggy trinkets. Alrighty, as of the time these sounds are leaving my mouth hole face, I have 511 hours in Dirty Bomb making it the second most played game of mine on Steam, second only to DayZ. Don't you fucking judge me. Yeah, DayZ's a shit fucking game, but sometimes it was a shit fucking game in your favor. It was fun. It had its moments. There was magic in DayZ, if you can dig through all the shit to find it. In any event, I purchased this game, Dirty Bomb, in June 2015, and since then I've amassed those hours fairly consistently. And I know I'm going to be coming back to this game as the years roll by and as it's updated and as new things are added. And since, since uh, recently, Nexon is gone and Splash Damage has publishing rights to this game and it's gone more close to indie than ever, I foresee, as they have said, them actually doing a lot more of the game than they used to. Indeed, updates are rolling out quicker than before. We can already see this. It also gives me hope that this game will continue to be updated into the future. It's not going to be something that they just pick up and abandon. Now they have much more of a stake in this game. The developers themselves have much more of an incentive to keep it going. They can't fall back on a publisher or anything like that. This is their baby now. And there is a solid, solid foundation to Dirty Bomb that I hope grows and grows and becomes even more great as time rolls on. Well, I think I've been running my mouth enough about Dirty Bomb. Dirty Bomb is a fantastic team-based, class-oriented, 
free to play shooter maybe the best on the market right now it definitely has the potential to be one of the great leading examples of how awesome the genre could be if it isn't already and i think it is i hope it does well and i hope a lot of you guys decide to at least try it so that you can have as much fun as i have playing it so before i head on out if you would like to support me on patreon which i would be very very appreciative if you did there will be a link in the description if you want to help me out you can follow me on Twitter if you want to hear me in between videos bitching about things. Let me know what you think about Dirty Bomb. Let me know if you think it's as good as I think it is, or if there are any flaws or problems that you had that I sort of missed. I'll see you guys around, and thanks for watching.